What's up, everybody at Codex? This is Dan Kelly here with my partner tonight, Uncle Gary, talking to the comic legend that is Mike Grell, who has graciously uh, agreed to do an interview with us. So I want to thank you for coming on and taking some time to talk with us tonight. Uh, how are you doing? My pleasure, guys. I'm glad to be here. At my age, I'm glad to be anywhere. But I'm <laughs> so um, I just wanted to start out. I know, man. Um, so kind of before your career, when you started in comics, I was reading that um, I know you were in the Air Force <laughs> before you got into comics. And um, I know you spent some time in the Air Force as an illustrator. What were you doing? What were you illustrating when you were in the Air Force? And was it anything that helped you out later on with your comic career? Uh, yes, I, uh, it was a, a great training ground for uh, basic graphic arts. Um when I was stateside, I was uh, with the 97 Bombardment Wing, uh, and it was a B-52 B base in Arkansas. And part of my job there was to draw the maps that the pilots were supposed to use when they had to fly over and bomb Moscow, which it's a lucky thing they never had to because <laughs> our guys couldn't find their butts in the dark with both hands. And all <laughs> wow. Uh, and I, I did I did uh, um, the very first aircraft recognition drawings of the uh, MiG twenty three Foxbat. Wow! Yeah, that uh, that's pretty cool. I, I did. Read yeah, the cool part. I was I was I was working from spy photos. You know, oh. buttonhole camera photos. Yeah, they they couldn't uh, publish the photos because. They were a dead giveaway from where they had been taken. Yeah. It'd be easy to track down the guy. But uh, yeah. Wow, that's that's pretty cool. I don't think many yep. illustrators can say that they did something like that. No, and, not at and, all. Um, two years two years into it, uh, when I once I qualified for the GI Bill, uh began taking the famous artist school's correspondence course in cartooning. Uh, it was a actually a really great course. Yeah. Um yeah, it was designed by guys like Al Cap and Rube Goldberg, oh. Milton Kniff, and guys like that. Um, and uh, I was working on that. I took my took my books with me overseas when I was transferred to Saigon in 1970, and uh, I continued the course there. Um, got to do more illustration there than otherwise. Every time there would be a a uh, big wig come through country. They'd have to have a, a um, commemorative uh, caricature of them uh, drawn, and I was the guy for that. Oh wow! Yeah, uh, the what? most interesting thing I did though in the Air Force was uh, when I was originally scheduled to return home for uh, Christmas, in 1970. Uh, I applied for and was granted an early out, but in the, in the middle of my going away party, when I was already three sheets to the wind, my CO told me that my orders had been redlined because um, I had the highest security clearance of any illustrator in all of Southeast Asia, and uh, I had I had to stay behind. And over Christmas, 1970, I did a uh, um, top secret briefing for the president and the joint chiefs, um, commanders on the ground in um, Vietnam, there were only 12 copies wow. in existence. Oh, wow. And when I opened it up, I was floored because I, I thought we were going home right away because it turned out to be the outline for the withdrawal of troops from Vietnam. Wow. And as I read into it, I discovered that they weren't going to start until spring of 1973 and were not going to finish until April 1975. All skillfully coordinated to, to time with the elections, which is why to this day, the only thing I hate worse than politics is politicians. <laughs> Mike, that'll certainly make you a cynic when they had plans to shut yeah. the war down three years yeah. in advance and they put them fellas right. through the meat grinder for nothing. Wow. Yeah. And, and if you, and, and if you go to the wall, yeah, 
Yeah, if you, if you go to the wall in Washington, uh, the Vietnam War Memorial, it's a, a, a long, deep slash in the ground as if someone took a, a corner of a table and just pushed it down into the ground. And the deaths are all in the order. Uh, all the names are in the order that they died in the war. 57,000 guys. And that corner where you turn the corner and you start coming back up again, that corner was Christmas 1970. Wow. And, and everybody after that. Wow. Yeah. Everything after that, just a word. Mike, I want to thank you for your service. You yeah. Know, the fact yeah. that you're a Vietnam vet. I, that, that, I, that, I, I came out of it really, really well. Listen, um, you did, but the, you, still, you still stepped yeah, up it, and you served. And that's something to be admired and appreciated. So, you know, uh, you know, I, I mean that, and I mean that for all our veterans, and you are certainly one of them, sir. Yes, sir. I I benefited greatly from my Air Force experience, uh, not um, the least of which I I uh, tapped into it for uh, uh, Travis Morgan in in the USAF. You certainly did. Seventy one pilot. Yes, you did. Uh, and I've I've uh, also delved back into it for John Sable Freelance. Yeah. Um, there's there's one story that I that I did. Uh, um, it's the first issue of the MIA stories. Um, Powerful. Yep, they were great. And and uh, it's got a couple of sequences in there that are 100 percent true. Uh, the uh, the character of Frankie Abbott is actually Mike Gold. Really? Oh, yes. Wow. Yes. It's actually Mike Gold. He's and he's your longtime uh, editor that for many years. Yes. I've met Mr. Gold on many occasions. He is a fantastic yeah. man. He is a, a a wonderful raconteur. And he and I bonded over the fact that we both Rod, loved Rod Serling and that I knew about Rod Serling's work uh, besides Twilight Zone Patterns and Requiem for a Heavyweight. He, 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 uh, he yeah. gave me a little bit of love because I went beyond Twilight Zone with Rod Serling. So, yeah. Uh, but my yeah, gold, hard, wow. Hard not to love Ron Serling, boy. Oh, yeah. yeah. Without a Especially doubt. Especially our generation. Oh, it's still an influential show, Mike. Still an influential show. Wow. Yeah. For, without a doubt. But I did not realize that that was Mike Gold. I'll have to reread that and put uh, yeah. in, into yeah, those. That, yeah. that whole sequence, that, that opening sequence uh, about uh, getting the letters from the POWs, uh, smuggling them, them out of. Um, out of Vietnam and uh, 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 taking them to an office building in New York where they were repackaged with um, uh, an, a note of explanation as to how that that letter came uh, into the possession of these guys. That's all 100% true. Wow. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, that will, I will, again, I'm going to have to, I'm going to go reread that because it's been, it's been a while. I have every issue of Sable. I haven't collected in trade. I haven't collected in single issues. I bought them off the rack, but I have not read that story in years. But I remember it was a two part MIA or POW story. And it was, I think it was two parts and it was fantastic. So I will have to reread those with that new knowledge that Mike Gold has a starring role in it. Yes. Very so um, after you got out of the military, how long was it after you got out of the Air Force before you started uh, in the comic industry? I got out in um, January of 1971, and uh, September of 1973 was when I started. In fact, last weekend, last Saturday, was my 50th anniversary in the business. Yep. Wow. That's yeah. Impressive. Yeah, 50 years. Um I, uh, I went first to um, uh, Chicago. Uh, I attended the Chicago Academy of Fine Art, um, mostly because they were um, boasting of a couple of really great alumni. Um, Walt Disney, mm -hmm. turns out he was expelled. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, the, but the, you know. All's forgiven when they can brag about him, right? Sure. Um, and um, Hal Foster. Yes. Okay. Uh, from, like, um, Prince Prince Valiant. Valiant. But yeah, but then yeah. again, Foster and his buddy rode their bicycles down from Winnipeg, Manitoba, 
and they attended every single I art school in best Chicago. Best oh, wow. They would they would sit in on our classes until the school found out they hadn't paid any tuition. <laughs> They'd pitch them in the street and just go on to the next school. Wow, that's a, that's a great story. Yeah. That 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 that's incredible. And when you started out, you started at DC. How was it? How was it that you got started at DC? And um, you know, like, what were some of your first assignments that you got there? Um, I I got started in uh, at, at DC because I was in uh, New York for the Phil Sulling Comic Book Convention, New York Comic Con, nineteen seventy three, and um, I uh, every time had a a, a portfolio <laughs> with a comic strip that I was trying to pedal called Savage Empire. It was about um, an archaeologist who falls through a time warp and winds up in Atlantis. And uh, I had six weeks of Sundays and two weeks of Mondays and the whole outline for the rest of the story. Um, but I, to my dismay, there wasn't one single newspaper artist or editor at that convention. Uh, and when I made phone calls trying to get an appointment to talk to somebody, they wouldn't even they wouldn't even let me in the door because adventure strips were dead. You know, Funky Winker Bean was going gangbusters, but adventure strips were dead. Um, so I left my portfolio with Saul Harrison, who was reviewing portfolios uh, at the time. And as I turned away, I had another copy. Um, as I turned away, uh, this older gentleman, and by older, I mean probably 20 years younger than I am right now, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Uh, in other words, a creaky old guy. <laughs> well into his 50s, you know, probably mid-50s. Um, standing there, and he asked if he could see my portfolio. And once he did, uh, he told me to get my carcass up to Julie Schwartz's office and show him. Um, and I asked can I tell him who sent me? And he said, just tell him Irv sent you. It was Irv Novick, who was the Batman artist at the time. Oh. Uh, and Irv became something of a mentor to me. Um, he was he was mildly alarmed at the, some <laughs> of the crappy figures I was drawing, and he gave me a few lessons. Um, <laughs> the Legion of Superheroes, if you look at those guys in the early issues, if they all have size four feet and, <laughs> and their arms are so short that if they had pockets, they wouldn't be able to reach their car keys. So, so um, uh, I, I was up at uh, Julie's office and uh, had, had my whole encyclopedia salesman speech prepared, you know, the afternoon, Mr. Schwartz, blah, 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 blah. And you rattled it on by rote. And if you get interrupted anywhere along the line, you have to go all the way back to good afternoon, Mr. Schwartz. That's right. exactly how far I got. Good <laughs> afternoon, Mr. Schwartz. And Julie said, what the hell makes you think you could draw comics? Wow. <laughs> and I said, I said, take a look and you tell me. Um, he flipped through my portfolio, called Joe Orlando in from the office next door and i walked out half an hour later with a script wow was, uh, aquaman uh seven page backup story and there you right go right here yep and yep. aquaman and I, I got all kinds of hell for aquaman mooning the audience <laughs> and, and, I think, and on and a later and, page yes right on there a later right. page yep there he is uh, aquaman sitting on the throne yes I, sitting on the throne yeah, I was known for about two months. I was known around the office as the guy who drew Aquaman sitting on a toilet. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so uh, Mike, I, I, I dropped uh, off my my first. I dropped off my first assignment and collected another script. And when I got home, the phone was ringing. It was Joe Orlando, who said, uh, "Murray Boltonoff is on vacation. He doesn't know it yet." But Dave Cockrum just walked off the Legion of Superheroes, and he's minus an artist. Can you handle a monthly book? Of course, wow. I can handle a monthly book. And then, you know, it's like when you ask an actor, "Can can you 
scuba dive or can you ride a horse? Yes, of course. Yes, I can. Of course, of course I can. I was born on a horse. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you figure you got two months to take lessons, right? So, um, so Mike, I my first exposure to you was that issue of adventure comics. So you have 50 years in the industry. Um, so that started in the, the end of uh, 73, early 74, I believe that issue came out. And I am uh, in, in just a few months, as soon as the, the calendar turns, I will celebrate my 50th anniversary of collecting comics. So, so I'm far done. I've amassed 58,000, but one of my early ones was that adventure comic? I was collect, you know, I love the Spectre in there, and Aquaman was still my was my favorite hero at the time. And that backup story that you drew with him, I loved it. I loved your art, and you drew I think like four or five of them. And then you got the Legion gig, and the first Legion of Superheroes book I ever bought was two hundred three, your first issue, and that was an amazing issue. And you killed, you know, y'all killed Invisible Kid in that issue. It was very touching. It was very poignant. It was a tragic little romance. I still think that book holds up well. So my my threads with you go back to your very first work with DC. So that's why it was really cool. That's why I wanted to talk to you, you know, to be to be with Dan to talk to you about this because that first uh, Aquaman story, your first work that was published DC, I bought it off the off the spinner rack, and my first Legion off the spinner rack was your was your copy. So that. You know, you influenced, you were one of the big influences in my early love of comics. So to me, this is just, you know, this is just me saying thank you. Thank you for. It would have been cheaper for you. It would have been cheaper for you if I had just taken you out and bought you some crack. (laughs) (laughs) It it, it probably. 58,000 comic books. 58,000, my friend, and still growing. And still growing. But uh, Um, you're one of my early heroes. That first Legion story, um, um, I, I did a um, inked a, a tryout over Dave's pencils. Uh, there's, I think, 11 pages that I inked over over Dave Cockrum, and uh, brought the the pages in, handed them over to Murray, and he took them, went down the hallway, and comes back and says, oh, "We got good news and I got bad news." I said, "Well, what's the good news?" He said, "You got the job." He said, nice. Well, what's the bad news? He said, "You can expect to get hate mail." Yeah, so, yeah. I, I hadn't even had anything published yet, right? And uh, he said, "Doesn't matter. For starters, you're replacing the most popular artist we ever had on the book, and to top things off, we're killing off one of the fans' favorite characters in your first issue." Ooh, yeah. And, oh man. Yeah. And fan mail is brutal. It was brutal. What was the? Uh, you said that you know they. Um called you and told you they were giving you the gig and it was your first ongoing monthly book what was the lead time from when they told you okay you're going to be taking over as the artist on this book to when you actually you know had to have your deadline for the first issue like did you have a long lead time or was it something like you need to get on this right no no uh our lead time in those days was a book a month there was just no two ways about it uh, when when I was given the assignment, my my audition was inking that that book that Dave had uh, already penciled, eleven pages of it, and the very next book was my first issue. Yeah, you know, there's there's not, nothing in in terms of okay, we'll give you two months to do this one or anything like that. It was no. It was, wow jump in and do it you had to hit the ground running didn't you oh yeah yeah you had you had to hit the ground running um and it, 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 it chad harden's um personalized license plate says fast draw <laughs> no wait a minute draw fast draw, draw fast <laughs> okay yeah. draw fast yeah so what was it like drawing the legion on a monthly basis as your first book, a nightmare. You the large cast, and you have to make all of them look distinctive. It was it was just an absolute nightmare. Um, oh. there, there there are always between nine and twenty five characters on a page, yep. and 
all have to be drawn, all have to be inked, all have to be, you know, uh, precise and everything else. Um, I, I mentioned uh, uh, how I used to draw really short arms and really small feet. Um, the the one critique I got from Murray Boltonoff was, um, he said, you draw your women too tall. And I said, women are tall. He said, no, they're not. I said, yes, they are. He <laughs> goes, how tall are you? And I lied. I think I said five foot seven, right? He says, trust me, women are short and so are you. Uh, so <laughs> he, he, he said, I, I want you to make all the women a head shorter than the guys. I said, that's going to look weird. So I settled for making them half a head shorter. Well, Mike, I always thought that you drew some of the most beautiful long-legged women. And that, that certainly is the case, my friend. So that, uh, that's, that was the genesis because the women in the Legion, and I mean, the costumes that they were wearing, there weren't a whole lot of costume there, but you always made those women look beautiful. And I know later on when you did Sable, I think Mike Blackman was supposed to be like 6'1", I think. So he's, you, she, yeah, she she's was, six feet tall, even. Yeah. Uh, he, he lies and says he's six feet tall. Yeah. But he's really like 5'10. Yeah. Know? Like every, every actor, uh, every actor who says that that he's five foot 11, no, he's five foot nine. Oh, yeah. Uh, maybe five foot nine. If he well, says I he's six that, feet, he's maybe 5'10. I did that playing ball where I would inflate my, I mean, I was still a big guy, but I would inflate my weight, you know, a little bit. Make myself a little heavier than, than I was playing. Um, y- your Legion run, I, I, it was my it's my favorite run of the Legion. I loved you as an art style. Did the fans eventually, with the mail you were getting, I mean, you ended up being quite the fan favorite, if I remember correctly, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, and well, while I was on the book, was it, while I was on that book, uh, it went right to the top on the sales at DC. Uh, and, and my goodness, that just the creation of Dawnstar makes you a legend. What a, you know, what a beautiful character that was. What a neat character, but what a stunning visual that that character had. So I know that was a, you know, you know, when I, all... you know, when I pre- presented the character to uh, Murray Boltonoff, he said, "Well, what's her superpower?" I said. She's a girl with wings and she can fly. <laughs> there said, you go. Yeah, but what's your power? I said, she can fly. He said, they can all fly. They got the ring. <laughs> that's like, oh my god. That's she very true. Uh, Paul Paul came up with the angle that she could track anybody across the universe, feel their energy and, and track them down. I I didn't care. I was just happy to be able to draw a girl with wings yeah <laughs> well that was a cool addition i think her yeah. being a super tracker was cool and the fact that she had a native american look to her i think played into that so i think that was a i think that was a pretty good addition i don't think he steered you wrong there modeled ever so slightly after Cher. uh yes oh. i see that i sure do so nothing wrong with that nothing no wrong. She, look Cher is what 75 and she's still pretty good looking <laughs> 75. I don't know. Man, she, maybe she's 70. I don't know. <laughs> so I was gonna say, so you were on you were on Legion Superboy and the Legion for a while. And then I can't remember if you did anything between that and Warlord, but you, you started doing Warlord for DC in 1975. What was it like? What was the transition like going from being an artist on a book to now being the writer, the artist, you know, the, the creator of it completely? Like was that uh, a hard transition great. for you, or? Yeah, it was great. Uh, um, as I said, I I had geared myself toward doing comic strips, and most of those guys write their own material. There are some uh, writers who write several strips, and there are several team ups going on uh, right now between artist and writer. But back in those days, it was very common for. Uh, an artist to write his own material. And uh, I took that cue from Milton Kniff, who said, if you can create interesting pictures and tell a story visually, you should be able to string two words together and, and write an interesting story. Uh, you know, it, it takes a, a bit of doing, but anybody who's um, competent at English lit can, can manage it. 
or I don't know if you, if you have a, a good enough imagination to create the stories, uh, you, you can manage it. Uh, it's not exactly not exactly rocket science, although sometimes there is rocket science involved. Um, being in comics has been just a fantastic liberal arts education. Um, every time I would create a new character, I would delve as deep as I could into th that character's background. I want to know everything about them. Um, it, it didn't matter whether it was a, a fantasy character or or a, a real world type character like John Sable. Um, I I researched uh, everything I could get my hands on, and uh, like for instance, I know when his birthday is, right? I mean, that, that sort of thing. Oh, Not that it ever came up, uh, although I, I used to um, sort of celebrate his birthday. You know, every every year, he'd be another year older, just like I did with uh, Green Arrow. Um, I Because um, Julie Schwartz, Hand me a script once that uh, I think Elliot Magan had written, and uh, it had Oliver Queen saying something about blah blah blah. I'm not even thirty yet. I said, "No, wait a minute, hold on. He's got to be over 30. And Julie said, "No, none of our characters are over thirty. Uh, readers can't relate to anybody over 30. I said, "So, how long would you say?" Batman and Robin have been together like five years. And he goes, yeah, that's about right. So Robin would have been what? If, if, if Robin's 15 or 16 years old, he would have been 10 or 11 years old when they first got together. And he goes, yeah, said, I said, so you're telling me that a judge is going to award custody <laughs> of an 11 year old boy to a 24 year old billionaire. This is long before Michael Jackson. <laughs> and, and he, he just took a deep breath and muttered something and they changed the line. Wow. So I, I made it a point when, when I started doing my own stories to make my characters a year older than I was, at least a year older than I was at the time, uh, which is which is why um, uh, Oliver Queen was celebrating his, well, he actually kind of uh, having a crisis over over his birthday uh, right. right from the start. And every year I'd make him a year older and a year older and a year older, and uh, I, th I think it it made sense to the audience. I think they kind of liked that. Well, it humanized them too, Mike. It, it really did humanize them. So, yeah. With, with, All right. Without right. a doubt. Um, I, I also, you know, being a big fan of yours, I was also buying the Warlord books. And something that I just found out fairly recently that I didn't realize was that Warlord was – almost canceled after the second issue i believe it was i mean it first appeared first issue a third issue first yeah. issue is special eight we had that came out and then you right. got the series and then i think i saw a quote from you where you were looking at the the at the end of the book it says the end instead of a next yeah. issue blurb and yeah. you're like right. what the hell what the hell the end i've got a year's run in this from uh from carmine infantino and then all of a sudden they told you no, is that how it went? Uh, pretty much. I I said that to Joe Orlando. He said uh, Carmine canceled the book. I said he can't do that. He promised me a year's run, and Joe said he lied. He does that. Oh. Uh, fortunately, within just a matter of a couple of weeks or so, uh, Jeanette Kahn walked in the door and canceled Carmine. Oh, um, there you go. She had, yeah, she had. Uh, been following the whole DC lineup for more than six months, uh, knowing that she was coming in. And uh, it turns out that the the world was her favorite book in the line. Wow. Um, she, she got the, the printing schedule and said, 
where's the warlord? And they said, Carmine canceled it. And she said, Carmine's not here anymore. Put it back. <laughs> and so, yeah. So um, we, we picked up, um, it was bi-monthly at the time. Um, we picked up pretty much without a beat. Uh, and um, when the DC implosion hit yep. in, was it 75? I, I, I think I think it was seventy six or seventy seven, maybe even. Yeah, it might might have been. Um, it's all sort of vague back there, somewhere in the latter part of the previous century. Um, <laughs> but uh, when when the DC implosion hit, any book that was not canceled was made monthly. Ah, so. So that's how we got to be in the well. So Jeanette Kahn was a bit of a guardian angel for you because, um, oh, she was that. I mean, I, you know, I think about how much I love Travis Morgan and the whole whole world of the Warlord, and to think that it almost came to an end after three. I mean, that would have been devastating, and the, and for Jeanette to ride in and have that be her favorite book and her to put you back in, and then you end up getting monthly status and. You know, I, uh, Mike, I have every issue of Warlord. I have the trades that they've collected of it, but I'm still one of the ones banging the drum. God, we need a Warlord army. There's so much. And yeah, the last rumor I heard was IDW wants to go ahead and publish it, and DC doesn't even have to produce it. What the hell are they doing? What, what, what's going on with that, Mike? I don't know, except that... Uh... Nobody at DC can make a decision on their own anymore. Uh, it, it's not like the old days. Um, yeah. Everything is corporate. All Everything is related to the studio. Everything is related to how does this tie in with our film universe? Um, and and they're, they're missing a, a, a beat uh, because the world has got such a, a, a long history and has been so popular with readers all over the world for so long. Um, and these guys are old enough now to have the kind of bucks it takes to lay down a hundred dollars sure. for a book. You know, they yep. they they're they just can't seem to understand. Um, they they would rather do you know, sixteen more Batman titles or or Wonder Woman, or whatever, than uh, to take this enormous body of work and make money off of it for free. I mean, it wouldn't, yeah. it wouldn't cost them anything. IDW, IDW would handle the publishing and the distribution. Yeah. All DC would have to do is cash the check. That, that, that's what blows my mind: the fact that they that that the heavy lifting is going to be done by IDW and publish this thing. That's and right. I know. Listen, I have every issue, but I, I want to have it collected all in a wonderful, nice format. You know, I really would like to have it that way. And then I was hoping that maybe it would get boosted by the fact that it was just in a recent DC animated movie. And, you know, maybe it gets and then how did you know, um, I know that Warlord had appeared in the old Justice League um, Unlimited. But does that give you great pleasure as a creator to see something that you have um, created put on the screen like that. I mean, I would imagine that's a heck of a thrill to, to see Travis Morgan in a, you know, cartoon. I have seen the, uh, the old uh, Justice League, um, which I loved. It. I did too. Uh, oh, I, 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 thought, I, I thought it was, it was extremely well done. I think they tried to do too much uh, to incorporate every little tiny aspect of uh, the story into the the one ish, uh, one episode, but I understood what they were doing. They're basically establishing, um, staking their claim to the character, and and yeah, it it made good sense. Uh, the episode that they did with uh, the Viking Prince, yes, was mind blowing yes. because it looked like Joe Kubert's illustration. It sure did. I mean, it was just fantastic. As far as the the new movie, the War World. Mm -hmm. um, haven't seen it, uh, may not, um, un unless it comes 
unless it comes up on one of the streaming channels that I already get, I'll be damned if I'm subscribing to another channel just to watch that movie. Uh, well, I bought the DVD, so I would have it, and I have it that way. But I did enjoy seeing Travis Morgan in a cartoon, and I thought, I thought, I thought it was nice to see him there. So, I mean, I'm, you know, it, just just to have a character that I love there, and there's a there's a pretty cool scene in it that I really loved with Travis in it. So there was, there was a pretty good kick-ass scene by, uh, by that, that great character that you created. So I think, I think you would get a kick out of it. Uh, did they, did they feature Shakira? They had Shakira a little bit. Oh, wait a minute. Yes, they had Shakira a little bit. They had Mariah. They had um, Machiste. I did not see, I don't believe I saw Tara at all, but, uh, interesting. Um, I'm I'm curious whether they filled Demos. in the center of her, and they had bikini. Demos. Um, cool. Yeah, I'm trying to remember. You know, gosh, did they have her as the cat turning into the cat? Like, I'm trying to remember if they did or not. It's it's I'm a little, a little fuzzy on that, but there is a particular scene where there's something you don't think Morgan is going to get out of, and then he comes out of it, and he you know it's a pretty badass moment where Travis Morgan comes out of it. So, ah, cool. it, it, but it was pretty cool. cool to see, you know, these characters that you created and that I loved, um, you know, on the, on the screen. And, you know, I was hoping, well, maybe this will generate some support to get that daggone omnibus out there because that, yeah. I mean, that Warlord is one of my favorite characters, Mike. And I, again, just, uh, he needs to be seen I think more I, of. I think the reason it, it was so popular for so long was that, um, it was all pure imagination. Uh, I I set him at the world at the center of the earth because my favorite book uh, in in high school was Journey to the Center of the Earth. Yep. Which is why um, the the world is called Scartaris. It's named for the mountain peak that casts the shadow into the volcanic crater that points the way for them to to follow, to uh, go to the center of the earth, Scartaris and Shambhala, of course, a three dog night. Mm -hmm. uh, how does your light shine on the road to Shambhala? <laughs> um, and and uh, I, I fought like hell to keep from drawing a map. So as soon as I left the book, the first thing they did, they drew a map. Yeah. As much as the, it's just the worst thing you could do yeah. because you're establishing boundaries. Yeah. Why would you want to put a boundary on imagination? Yeah, I mean, I think the closest uh, you did was in the first issue where you just kind of, <clears throat> you know, had the earth and he shows, all right, you know, there's an entrance here and an entrance here and everything's in the center. Right. And like, that's it, you know, exactly. Why do you want to, why do you want to limit it when you could come up with something later on? And, you know, it's right. already a finite space if you put the map there and then you, come up with an idea later you're like well we can't do this because where are we going to put it exactly uh, it, uh i think marvel fell into that trap uh, by trying to adhere to the maps uh, uh from the conan books um you know if he was in the desert in one episode he had to make his way out of the desert before he could put him someplace else i had morgan in snow country i had him in jungles, I had them in lost cities. You know, the, the fun part about it was that that there was never a, a, an ice age in in Scartaris, so the dinosaurs never died out. Right. Um, right. And the, the the lost cities were founded by survivors survivors of Atlantis. Yep. So you have all the science fiction stuff. You can do any kind of story. Well, even that, Certain stories for you, science fiction, fantasy, just good fun. Well, even that first issue when you had him, you know, kind of go to sleep and wake up and he's got the full beard and he says, oh, time's kind of, you know, I, I forget how you phrase it, but time's kind of wonky here. Like right there off the bat, you know, you're just telling the reader, you know, That's, don't they, expect yeah, anything. The, I can my, do my anything editor, in this uh, world. Yeah, Jack Harris, when he was editing, uh, managed to confuse the issue greatly by insisting that uh, time had to flow differently in different parts of Atlantis. No, 
if if there's no means of measuring the passage of time, you can't say, well, the sun was over here and it travels across the sky, comes back again, that's a day. The sun is always straight overhead. Yep. You can't measure all the stars because no star there are none. Oh, right. Right. So um if you fall asleep and you wake up and you're rested, you don't know how long you've been asleep. You could have been asleep for three hours or three days or three months. You know, in the case of, of Travis Morgan, I thought it was just really fun yeah. to have the guy. He's, he's, he's been through all of this yeah. adventure and hasn't slept maybe for weeks at a time. So when he falls asleep, he wakes up and by golly, he's got a beard. Mike, my youngest child is uh, Olivia Morgan Lawhorn. So I had you sign a book for her last year to Olivia Morgan. So my, my, my youngest child is sporting Travis Morgan's name. That's how influ influential the character was to me. So uh, That's funny. Great stuff. That's funny. Oh, I guess lucky for her you decided not to make her middle name Travis. Yeah, that's right. I guess so. <laughs> I guess so. Olivia Morgan, which was really cool. So, so since you since you created um since you created Warlord and came up with the whole world, what was it like when you eventually like I know your wife ghost wrote the book for a while while you were working on other stuff, but what was it like for you when you left the book and other writers and other artists came in and took it over? Like did you still read it and follow it? You know, did you No, you know, the the first issue started? that I the first issue that I read uh, af after I had stopped doing the book, after uh, Sharon had, had ghosted, um, uh, it, with the full knowledge of the editors, um, they didn't care uh, as, as long as the materials still kept flowing. And uh, we collaborated on, on storylines, but uh, I would uh, pretty much uh, left her to her own devices. Uh, she was very very talented writer um but the the first episode that uh the first issue that i read that uh, i think it was mike friedrich wrote i i had left off with uh an outline of where i thought the story should go and i split morgan and tara up because i wanted him to go off and have solo adventures that would maybe lead to little more sexcapades. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, face it, uh, Shakira is either a woman who turns into a cat or a cat who turns into a woman. Yeah, you uh, don't know which one. Of, <laughs> of drawing Morgan in bed with the kitty cat curled up on his crotch. <laughs> Because that's what cats do, right? That's right. Uh, and and I left a note saying, um, I think it's important that you keep the the characters separated for at least a year. Well, apparently the writer had gotten religion and um, thought that was the wrong thing to do. So, very first issue, they're back together, um, and. It, it, to my way of thinking, it was, it was blowing a really good chance. Uh, you know, there's a reason why every time he would return after gallivanting around the countryside, um, she'd knock him down. She'd bust yep. his nose, knock him on his ass. Hi, honey, I'm home. Wham! <laughs> and, you've got, you've, that's a theme in your books, women knocking dudes out, because... Uh, one of my favorite issues when you're writing the Green Lantern run is when, I mean, Green Arrow run, is when Travis Morgan comes to the surface world and he comes to Seattle and everyone in Seattle starts picking fights with him and he's getting pissed off and then he realizes it's because Oliver Queen is operating in Seattle and he tracks down where Queen lives. Queen opens the door and he punches Ollie. And he says, I don't know what you've done to everybody, but that's for everybody coming after me because of you. And then Dinah, the canary, comes out to see what the commotion is. And she says something. He says, get back to the kitchen. And she she decks him. And I think there's a great scene where Travis Morgan, Oliver Queen are on the ground 
lick, you know, holding their wounds. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and Ollie says to Travis, I could have warned you about that. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. So you have a great tradition of women kicking men's asses. That's great. Hey, when, when, when you grow up to be five foot seven <laughs> and all the girls in school are taller than you. Yes. For like up until that last year. I mean, all of them were taller than me. I was, I was four foot, I think four foot eleven, as a sophomore, weighed wow. eighty seven pounds, and any one of those girls, especially farm girls, could kick my ass. My <laughs> wife still can. <laughs> well, well, speaking of, you know, since he's speaking of Green Arrow, you know, when you did that, when you did the Longbow Hunters, and then you took over as the writer of the run, like you made a lot. <laughs> of big changes to him he moved him to seattle yep. you know he got you know i got the the run of it here you got the um the new costume for him you got rid of the trick arrows you know you had him like killing people you know in longbow hunters there's the scene where he you know where they're basically torturing dinah and he shoots the arrow right through the guy you know um i read right. that, you, that you didn't have anybody refer to him as green arrow because you thought that the name was dumb but like you, you aged the character up. You made him a lot more urban. Like, did you get any pushback from DC on all of these changes you were making, or did they kind of encourage I, you, like, "Hey, do do all this, do I, more"? I I had uh, the world's best wingman, Mike Gold. Yep. Uh, Mike called me up and and said, uh, "No, what about Green Arrow? Uh, any any character you like well enough to." come back, bury the hatchet, and come back to work at D.C. Um, and he mentioned Green Arrow. I said, always been my favorite comic book character since I was a little kid, even. Um, the the uh, the little boy, uh, young Oliver Queen, uh, shown running around with arrows stuck in his T-shirt, down the back of his T-shirt with a stick bow. That was me. I mean... I shot my first bow when I was about four years old, pulled it back about that far and let go of the string. And the arrow probably flew all of maybe five or six feet, but it stuck in the ground. And at four years old, that is the coolest yeah. damn thing you could imagine. Yeah. And, and I was hooked uh, ever since then. Um, I, the green arrow, you know, the Robin Hood legend, yeah. everything is that that's all part of it. Um, the changes that I made, um, I just come off of uh, John Sable Freelance, and I was frankly tired of doing muscle bound guys in skin tight suits. But given the chance to do Green Arrow, um, I told him right off the bat that I wanted to make some changes. For starters, the trick arrows had to go. It's just you know, the lock picker arrow was was bad <laughs> enough, but but the boomerang arrow. I mean, come on! I don't know if you've ever thrown a boomerang, but I did once. <laughs> Damn thing came back and and was going to take my head off. Might have if I hadn't gone flat on the ground. It it left a a, a gouge in the side of the barn behind me, about <laughs> half an inch deep. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, yeah, no. No boomerang arrows. Um, uh, other changes. Um, I set them in Seattle instead of the mythical star city because I wanted a real world setting. And being a, a small town guy from a tiny little town, uh, 100 miles north of Green Bay, Wisconsin, um, I had only ever lived in three cities in my life. First was Chicago, where I went to art school. New York, where I broke into business. Um, didn't actually live in the city, but outside the city. And Seattle, where I was living at the time that I uh, started doing the Longbow Hunters. Uh, and it's important that you get the atmosphere of the city correct. You know, you can't talk about the slums of Rodeo Drive, right? You know, people are going to know that you're, you're blowing it out your ditty bag. Um, <laughs> so so along with all of that stuff um, came the fact that 
it has a tendency to rain just a tiny little bit from say September through first part of June, like <laughs> almost every day, right? <laughs> Not quite, but it, but it feels like it after, after a long winter like that. Um, so um, sleeveless costume and green tights, no, that was going to cut it. So I gave him sleeves. I gave him proper trousers. Um, the hood. Put the hood on him because that little Robin Hood cap wasn't going to keep him dry. And it also gave me um, a chance to um, tackle other little aspects of the, of the character as well. Um, and the reason that I kept the color scheme the same dark green, light green, was because I didn't want to take a chance on someone opening up the book and go, who the hell is this? You know, maybe have a guy in some kind of a purple costume or whatever, right? Wait a minute, mm -hmm. what's Hawkeye doing? Yeah, going out, right? Yeah. right? Yeah. Um, so, so that was all part of it. And the other change that I made, you, you mentioned the scene with Dinah being tortured and Ollie sticks an arrow straight to his heart. Um, he had already demonstrated that he's perfectly capable of shooting a knife out of the guy's hand, but he didn't because the son of a bitch had it coming. He really had it coming. Yep. Um, and that was also done to give Ollie a reason to change. Um, Denny had set up a scenario where he had accidentally killed a man and swore he would never ever ever take another human life yep. and yeah you know, shaved his head joined a monastery burned his bow i mean all, all that stuff and uh i went nope uh in in a real world situation um you'd kill to protect your family yep you killed you'd kill if if someone were committing a violent crime and you had the ability to stop it, but it meant you had to take a life to do it. I, I don't think many people will really necessarily hesitate to do that. Um, but at the same time, um, I don't believe in passing off violent acts just for the sake of violence. Um, but in, in Sable, uh, when I had him get shot, the next issue, he was still suffering the after effects, and and it's a long process. Uh, it, it's it's not like you know in 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 movies or or television or whatever. You know, next week there's no sign of bullet hole, there's no scar, there's nothing whatsoever. All this stuff leaves scars, and in Oliver and Dinah's case, it left a scar on their relationship. Um, his his change was a choice that he made. He could have shot the knife out of a guy's hand, but he chose to stick it through his heart. Um, and he felt the after effects of that um, came back to haunt him uh, seriously. Uh, caused some some deep psychological problems for him. Um, wound up in the bottom of a bottle at one point. Um, and with with Dinah, um, those two had the the best sex life in comics. There was never <laughs> any question. Even when when Eddie was was uh, writing the characters, you knew they were popping in the sack every chance they got. And I, I started it off literally with a bang um, in in uh, Longo Hunters. And uh, but as a result of what happens to her in that story, all of a sudden she can't stand to be touched. And that creates a, a, a problem in their relationship. So I dealt with that. And all, all of those things, all those changes. Um, tried to be as uh, honest with my characters as I could be. 
you know, what would they experience? What would it be like? What would they go through? Uh, how would they come through it? And and they they do they 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 make their way through it um, with sometimes great difficulty, but they make their way. Um, one of my favorite stories that I did, uh, I turned the situation around to where Ollie was the one who was captured by the bad guys and they're torturing him. And Dinah comes to his rescue and she is a lioness. And the bad guys are closing in and she's got the gun and she's determined she's going to save two bullets. One for him and one for her. She said, I'm not going to let them hurt you again. Uh -huh. And she would have. You got to read the book <laughs> in order to see, in order to see what happens. But yeah, Dinah is Dinah is Ollie's hero, and was always intended to be. Um, she's every every bit his equal. Um, she's not subservient or subordinate uh, in any way, shape, or form. Um, if you've met my wife, so you understand. Yep. I, I, I greatly admire admire strong, independent women, um, and uh, she's uh, just she's just amazing. Hey, look, she's I, look, look, you can't hear what I'm saying, but she'll watch she, this later on, and I'll get some. I'll get some good. good we were talking. Yeah, I know she was a treat to meet. That's for sure. I enjoy talking to her. And look, I'm married a. I married a damn near six foot tall redheaded hairdresser. So I'm a brave man myself. So, you know, I wow. love, yeah, I know. <laughs> I love, I love strong women too. You know, Ollie and Dinah's relationship. Now see Longbow Hunters for me is, you know, easily in my top 10 comic stories of all time. And, and part of that, not, you know, their relationship was a real relationship. It wasn't, two-dimensional characters on a page that was a real living breathing relationship between a grown man and a grown woman and like you said there was a lot of sex appeal in that too because you're right they they had a they had a very you know um they had a very loving relationship they had a very um pleasure-minded relationship they were having fun but it was but it was real. It was absolutely 100% real. And you could feel, you know, you reading that you could, you got the sense of that passion. And then that's also because of that is what made it so poignant when he did kill that guy, because it was personal. It was personal. Right. It hurt somebody that he had loved. And it was, it was a, a de definite, um, you know, it was a definite statement that he wasn't going to, you know, that that guy was getting payback and, and Dinah, I'm with you too. She is, she is kick ass as a character and you know you had that ferocity in her and you're you know subservient i see ollie as being a little bit subservient to her she was the you know she was you know more of a badass than he is yeah um when i, I, I did a story where she winds up kicking eddie fire's ass yeah, oh yeah and, and, and he and, deserves and it. it and it turns him on <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Eddie had it coming. Eddie had it coming. Oh my goodness. Oh yeah. Well, a hot blonde fishnets, you know, it's uh there's worse people to have your butt kicked by. <laughs> oh yeah. That is very true. I want to go back to something that you had said earlier. Um, you said when they when they got you to go back to DC and they said, you know, what would it take you to for you to bury the hatchet and go back? So when you had left DC, you had you had done the creator owned stuff like you talked about, the John Sable Freelance and the star slayer. So what was it that caused you to leave DC to start doing the creator own stuff? Because something like warlord, I mean, that could have easily been, you know, as its own kind of thing, like that could have easily been a creator own thing. You know, maybe if you've done it years later, was it? Uh, yeah. Unfortunately. Yeah. Unfortunately, DC was not doing any creator own stuff. And, um, no one was paying royalties, uh, and, and it just seemed wrong to me. So when the opportunity came uh, for me to do a book with uh, Pacific Comics, I did Star Slayer. Uh, I had initially created Star Slayer to be a companion title to the Warlord, uh, just a, a reverse on the theme. Primitive Man uh, in a ultra 
futuristic society versus a modern man in a primitive society. And uh, with, with the same intent, it was going to be just a bunch of good fun, which uh, as time wore on, I, I realized that uh, I had a real gem of a character in uh, the Tamara character. Um, yeah. uh, once again, uh, strong leading lady. Yep. And uh, yeah, she, she essentially became the, the star of the piece. Um, uh, it just, she was more interesting, more complex than the, the Torn McClellan character. But again, given the opportunity to own my own property and earn royalties from the sales of the books, that was what did it. Uh, when Mike Gold called me up and said, uh, we're cre creating a company in Chicago called First Comics. Um, I'd, I'd, I'd joke and say, like, first comics, then drugs, then the babysitter winds up with a free. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but but the, the, the whole drive of it was creators going to own their own material and earn a royalty on the sales. And uh, we launched because um, nobody was doing it at the time. And in fact, the reason why uh, Chris Claremont wound up flying around in his own personal Lear jet is because we did that. The companies had to fall in line. They right. had to follow suit, or they were going to lose all their talent if they if they hadn't started to pay royalties. The, the guys would have jumped ship. There's just no question about it. Um, one of the one of the neat things about being associated with DC all these years is I've said that before. If DC owes you 38 cents, they'll spend 50 cents on a postage stamp to mail you a check for 38 cents. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's just the way it works. Um, every quarter, I, I get uh, a royalty statement, and it'll be sometimes literally 38 cents for this, uh, a, a buck seven for that. Uh, how many copies at you know uh, 22 cents you know things like that and on and on and on and on and on and at the end of the page you got a nice little paycheck out of it for stuff that i did 50 years ago no do you, still have, you don't have to chase them for it like you do just about everybody else you know how much royalties i made on my iron man run at marvel Oof. zero and that was some Not major yet. changes you did that, right? Because you had Iron Man reveal to the world that he's Tony Stark. I mean, that's something that's, you know, that's a, that's a pretty major thing with the character now since then. Yep. Yep. That was my and, your, and your thank you was this, Mike? Your thank you was a, a big zero? Is that is that right? <laughs> it, it is exactly zero. It's a big <laughs> old goose egg. Yeah. yeah. Zero. You, had, you had too when you with the with the John Sable character, you had that turn into a TV show that ran a season or so, right? What was that like? It, you know, it, it was awful. It's it just oh, the really? most terrible thing I've ever seen. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, my my take on Sable well, when when Gold called me up, offered me carte blanche anything I wanted to do. Um, I I chose to. Uh, make him um, give an, an African background because I always loved Africa. Uh, I'd done the Tarzan comic strip in Sunday papers um, and actually wound up uh, going on safari a couple of times. Uh, but I, as a boy, I always dreamed about going to Africa. Uh, and I wanted to do the kinds of stories that would bring out my best work. You know, thing, things that I was interested in, uh, writing the kind of stories that I that I wanted to read. Uh, and uh, I've been very fortunate that so many people have felt the same way. Um, so the the uh, 
the development in it was that uh, my my spin really was like the reverse of Batman. No secret identity, none of this by day, the mild mannered, whatever, by night, the dark Avenger, nothing like that. Uh, Sable is Mr. Blood and Guts. You can look him up in the phone book under Blood Slash Guts, and then you know, there's probably a photograph of him um, with a gun in his hand or something like that. Um, but what only a few people know is that he's a closet nice guy. He writes children's books mm -hmm. uh, based on bedtime stories that he used to tell his own children about a troop of leprechauns living in a fairy mound in Central Park. And uh, he uh, writes under the name of B.B. Flem, F-L-E-M-M. And yep. it, when, you, when it's written out, it's not so bad. But when you say it, it's like, Flem? Really? Flem? Um, and... Uh, that's the only time he ever wears uh, any kind of disguise. He, he's got the battle mask, but that, it's face paint. You can't paint your face and have people go, oh, gosh, who is that masked man, right? <laughs> um, it's it's just like camouflage paint. Um, and uh, uh, the, the only time he wears a disguise is when he has to do a public appearance. Like uh, in today's world, it would be you know doing a convention appearance or a bookstore signing or anything like that. Then he puts on a purple Marx wig and a pair of nerd glasses and a big mustache and a tweed jacket and uh, goes there as, as B.B. Flynn. And uh, so ABC got hold of it and they reversed my reverse. By day, the mild-mannered children's author and by night, the dark Avenger. And oh, it was no. terrible. It was terrible. Except, of course, Renee Russo made her acting debut. Yeah. Well, see, she owes you and John Sable a big thank you then for Miss Russo does. Uh, look, I, John Sable, again, I collected every issue, bought them all off the rack, had the hard covers. And I thought, you know, I, I loved your, you know, I loved um, Star Slayer. I, I loved that book. And then that book also gave me one of my favorite characters, Grimjack. Uh, was a feature in that book. So, and, uh, you know, Tim Truman is also a guy that I, you know, was in my era and I love Tim's work, but I always, I always followed you. Sable, you know, Sable, you were writing that in New York. He was in, I mean, he lived in New York. Again, you're right in the city, you know, it was gritty. You were writing characters that looked like the people, the police chief was an African-American man. Was that a winners? I believe his name was. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, um, you had um, Sable, God, the, the, the former swordsman to Errol Flynn that was his uh, sword instructor. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, what, what a great character. You had a gay ballet Sonny dancer. Pratt. Yeah, it was Sonny Pratt. Uh, Sonny Pratt. Uh, that's uh, right. 70 odd year old uh, character who was actually uh, uh, modeled uh, half on um, Douglas Fairbanks Jr. and half on uh, Richard Farnsworth. Who was a stuntman? Right. Um, uh, he uh, he was in a movie called Comes a Horseman, uh, The Gray Fox. The Gray oh, Fox. That's right. Oh, yeah. that was fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. And, fantastic. And and Farnsworth, you know, but he, before he ever stepped in in front of a camera uh, as an actor, uh, he had been in hundreds of movies as as a stuntman, and. Uh, so he's he's Sable's fencing coach. Uh, so Sable that's was, great uh, that you that he was yeah, an athlete. Yeah, right. Oh, right, and pentathlete. That's right. Sable is yeah, a pentathlete. Yeah, because uh, um, uh, modern pentathlon is five guns. events: yep. uh, cross country running, swimming, uh, horseback riding, pistol shooting, and fencing. Yes, and it was all designed uh, in. Napoleonic times as a, a training for couriers. If if your horse was shot out from under you, you had to deliver the message on foot. Came to a river, had to swim it. Run into enemies, shoot your way clear, or when you're out of bullets, out comes the old sword. Well, I, I, that was a that's a great background for a man that did Sable's kind of work to have to have. So he certainly uh 
you know, he was certainly well it, equipped. It, it made you, sense. Uh, yes. It, it, it's a very simple, shorthanded way of letting people know that he can do all this stuff. So when he sets out on the on the trail of the guys who killed his family, he just runs them uh, down. What? What? Yeah, a, just, yeah, and that's in one of the great in the great traditions of tragic circumstances. Tragic circumstances becoming the origin for our heroes and the impetus for what they do in life. And and the fact that Sable was a guy that you could look up that could you know. If you needed a job done, he's the guy to call. He was a protector. And like you said, he was a nice guy, had a code about him. And, you know, one of the other great characters, you had a, a, a gay, I guess he was a ballet dancer that was a gay character yeah. in the early 80s. And that was a great portrayal. It wasn't a stereotypical, you know, por portrait of, of a homosexual person that was so apparent in the, or, you know, so often that you would see it was a, it was a, three-dimensional flesh and blood person and i mean you may and, and another character in the book you maybe fall in love with was eden kendall wow <laughs> eden kendall what? was ooh, yeah. you know she's oh, yeah. smoking, she, smoking hot redhead yes yeah. yeah, she was <laughs> well, well again i married a redhead so there you go yeah there so, you go there you yeah, go. The, the character you're talking about uh uh gray adler the the uh, mike blackman's mike yep. m y k e yeah um the, the lady who illustrates Sable's leprechaun stories. Um, uh, six feet tall to his five foot 10. And he's attracted yeah. to her. So he's he's been trying to put the moves on her. And um, one day he comes by her studio or uh, her loft, and, which she shares with Gray because an artist and a, and a, a dancer People in New York share living quarters a lot because guess what? It's expensive. Yep. I don't know how you yeah, can we, yeah. honestly afford to live there, uh, but but it is expensive. So it it made good sense for her to have a roommate, and I I set up the scenario where he's asking Mike out and. She's dodging him, and uh, then Gray comes in from the other room, and uh, Sable realizes he created a faux pas, so he's trying to smooth things over, and he winds up asking the guy if he wants to go watch a fencing match at uh, Madison Square Garden, and uh, goes, sure, so he goes off to change clothes, and Sable's apologizing to Mike. You know, I didn't know you were involved. And she said, we're not. Uh, I'm not his type. And she says, what's his type? Short, fat, and, uh, yeah, no. I think, yeah, short, short, fat, and dumpy or something like that. <laughs> and she says, no, tall, dark, and handsome. <laughs> and the expression on his face is like, Okay, I just made a date with this guy, right? Yeah, and and they they go out together, and they actually wind up having a great time. Yep. And and Gray explains to him, you know, it, it, you know, just because you're straight doesn't mean you hit on every woman you meet, does it? And Sable has to go, yep. well, <laughs> so maybe maybe he does, but pretty much. Yeah, yeah, but but they uh, uh, they had a have a great time together, and it's just that it's it's they're good yeah. friends. That's all they're going to be. They're they're going to be friends. Uh, Gray, as the series goes on, loves to poke fun at him. Okay, loves to tease him, not poke fun at him. Um, uh, about him um, being so uptight, right? Yeah, like if you, you know, if you just unclench a little, right? Yeah, exactly. So, my, uh, my, as, that was as, just such a. As, as go ahead, time, go ahead. As time wore on, uh, I I got a, a phone call from a guy I had known for maybe fifteen years, and uh, he said, "Mike, I'm calling all my friends because I want you to hear it from me. I'm gay." 
I laughed. I said, Andy, I could have told you that 15 years ago. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so um, he asked me if I would, if I would be uh, interested in uh, doing a panel at San Diego Comic-Con to discuss the role of gay characters in comics because I had created the first regular gay character in comics. And what I did, yep. I had I had no idea, not a clue. So I get to San Diego and open the convention booklet, and there it is, Gays in Comics featuring Mike Grell. <laughs> <laughs> Thereby ensuring that if I want another date uh, in San Diego, yep. I, I had to brown bag one from home. I mean, that, <laughs> wow. that, that was hysterical. Uh, Max Allen Collins and I were the two heterosexual bookends uh, on <laughs> either end of this dais with about maybe 12 people in between every combination of girl, girl, boy, boy, girl, boy, girl, boy, not so sure if it's a girl. Right. Right? Uh, and every one of them invited me to party with them after. <laughs> oh, there you go, buddy. <laughs> yeah. Hey, nothing wrong with that. Yeah. And, and you know, some, some of the guys, I, I was tempted to say, you're young, you're good looking, you could get girls. Oh, well. Hey, less competition. Less yeah. competition. Right? That's okay. <laughs> you know, when I would, you know, when I would do, you know, some acting in the shows, I didn't mind other dudes in the, the other dudes in the show is great. That's great because that's less competition, you know, because those needy actresses needed a shoulder to cry on. So I was there for them. Um, it, now, see, I didn't realize that that was the first gay ongoing recurring character in comics, but I, I mentioned him I no because I just knew that it seemed like it was ahead of its time. And there you go. It really was. It was the first character. So kudos to you for that. And I know what's really neat is that, um, this Sable book that I think is fantastic and groundbreaking has these great stories, these great characters, the, these great doses of you know humanity. Um, it, you've 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 re, they've been remastered, recolored, and collected in a brand new volume for folks yes. to get now, right? Where it's so yes. please please tell us please tell us. I mean, I have all the originals and I have everything else in trade, but for people that don't have this. And don't have this. This is a great way to get into the Sable universe. And please tell us, tell folks how they can do that. Yes, we we ran a, a Kickstarter uh, to uh, fund these uh, um, Master Stoke editions. Um, they're oversized. They're nine by twelve nominally, uh, nine by twelve inches, and the color has been remastered, not recolored, but remastered. Um, we went back in in most cases. Glenn Hammond's the the computer genius behind this. Um, he uh, went back in and um, in some cases went to the original black films of the black files and worked forward from there in order to correct the colors because some of those early book were. Huh, Excuse me, I'm boring myself here. Um, some of those were books. The, the not born us. The, You're not born us. Absolutely. Oh, the, the, some of those early books, the the printing was pretty crappy. Um, yeah. But unlike what DC did with um, the Swamp Thing book, where they scrapped Tatiana Wood's beautiful colors and recolored it all, overcolored it really. Um, digitally uh, in, in back to many fans viewpoint, it ruined the, the book. Um, we enhanced the color, made it, made it work brighter and stronger on the pages. Um, a couple of um, changes were made along the line some corrections because frankly there are plenty of places where I messed up uh, along the way but at, at the end of the day the book that you hold in your hand looks like the real thing it's about 400 and some odd pages long um, first uh, issue contains I think the first 13 uh, books from the Sable lineup 
um, including uh, two appearances of uh, Maggie the Cat. And oh, uh, yeah, yeah. And I saw that uh, you, you actually no, one yeah. appearance of Maggie the Cat. Um, I saw that you almost doubled what your what your goal was for the Kickstarter. Yes. Um, so it's in the, 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 audience second, the second volume is the, coming off the computer probably as we speak. It's going to the printer in October. We have a fulfillment house that is going to uh, allow us to um, ship all the material straight to them and everybody will get their books within two weeks after. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, so, and, and, and how do they get these? How, how, where, do, where do they go to to find these books? What, what is there a website or... Um, do they go to your site? No, the, the 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 best place to find those books is contact your local dealer. Uh, we we offered it through Diamond, and okay, uh, great. Yep, and we still have a few copies left. Now, for the for the first edition, um, we're only we're only going to uh, print a thousand copies of each one in first edition. Wow. First edition. Uh, in a later edition, which will be a more open-ended trade, uh, I, I guess you could call it uh, a trade edition, um, the, they'll be uh, available to order uh, as print-on-demand, so we don't have to warehouse them. And gotcha. It just, just makes better sense. I think we're down to um, about 150 copies of that first book oh um, yeah if you if you track me down at a convention where uh jeff messer is uh my editor-in-chief at masterstroke um jeff has been traveling with me uh, quite a lot in this past year and will continue to uh through next year as well uh when jeff shows up he almost always brings along a case of those books to sell at the table so Catch me at a convention. I'll probably have a few for sale. Oh, excellent. Jeff's a good man too. I I, I enjoy interacting with him too. He I, is hundred percent. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and a writer in his own right too. I have one of his. Yes, books. yes. Sex lies and rock and roll, right? Yep. Sex spies and rock and roll. Yeah, yep. You can't go wrong there. Now yep. with the, uh, I was going to ask with the success that you had with this Kickstarter, are you planning to do other ones in the future? Yes, absolutely. Um, the the first Sable book, uh, we did gangbusters on the Kickstarter. The second one for volume two, we far exceeded. We uh, made about 30% more off of the Kickstarter uh, because wow. people are starting to see what the product actually looks like. And uh, when you uh, back the Kickstarter, it, it's deeper than... If you bought it at a, at a bookstore, um, the, from there on, um, once we have this second volume of Sable done, uh, the next thing on the list will be Maggie the Cat. To nice. The, the Maggie the Cat. Um, and uh, the Pilgrim, uh, Mark Ryan's project, the Pilgrim, is going to get finished off. And then we're, we're expecting to... Um, release at least two volumes of uh, Sable Omnibus series. There'd be a total of, I think, five when we're okay. finished. Uh, we're expecting to re release at least two volumes next year. Are you Very good. Any other characters of yours, like Star or any of the other books, like Star Slayer or Shaman's Tears, or are you going to do any yes, of those? Yes, as a matter of fact, Shaman's Tears is being developed as uh, an audio drama. Oh, uh, wow. Oh yes, um, nice. it'll, it'll be it'll be in the form of a podcast, um, but it's going to be um, uh, every, every show will essentially be um, the the run of the comics. Okay, um, I don't know that we'll we'll fit everything into one episode per issue, but uh, we have a a, a strong cast. Um, all of the native characters are being played by native actors. Um, and 
Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, in conjunction with the Autry Museum uh, in Los Angeles called Native Voices. Wow. Um, the musical so soundtrack uh, will be by Native recording artists. Um, we have we have advisors on the show. People ask me if I have any Indian blood in me. Uh, like, yeah, uh, that right there on my thumb, you can mm -hmm. maybe see that. See that little crease right there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I got that the day after I saw the movie Hondo with John <laughs> Wayne. There's a scene where the Apache chief recognizes this little boy's courage, puts the thumbs together, cuts them, makes them blood brothers. Every little boy yep. in town had a Band-Aid on his thumb the next day. And, and that's mine. And then I've got a, another one here, uh, courtesy of a bottle of whiskey and a bowie knife. Oh. Uh, <laughs> let's see. That was, see it there? The base of my thumb? Yeah. Right there? yeah. In, in the that's days, fortunately, before HIV. Um, and I, I looked down and I said, you know, that's going to hurt like hell tomorrow. And the guy, guy really, the knife said, why? And he said, well, it hurts like hell right now, and I can't even feel my lips. <laughs> <laughs> well, but for, for future, Diana, for future Diana reference. Arapaho, Blackfoot Pony, and Nez Perce. Well, for future reference, a bottle of whiskey and a Bowie knife, not a good combination. No. But it sounds no, like it might make a hell of a story. It's, yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it's every bit as bad news as you can imagine, unless you throw in your firearms as well. Oh, yeah. yeah, there you go. Um, Mike, now, I wanted to bring up a story. When I saw you in Charlotte last year, besides, you know, for people that do see Mike at, at a con, um, you can get perfect, beautiful pieces of art like this done. And he drew this Travis Morgan for me. And it's, you know, uh, Dan's been to my library. It's got a wonderful home up there. But, you know, uh, Mike can uh, can certainly give you a wonderful keepsake you'll have the rest of your life if you see him. But and I was able to give Mike something. Yeah, I, I made I, Mike I'd grow. I was just going to say I'm represented by Scott Kress at Catskill Comics. If you go to my website, MikeGrell.com, right at the top of the page, there's a link that will take you to Catskill Comics. And you can place your order that way. Or track oh, me down okay. at a convention. There you go. Those, those so that it's great that they have an option if they can't make a con to see you, and you can have some wonderful original artwork hanging on your wall like I do. And again, Mike, you're one of my art, my one of my creative heroes, so I love it. But I was able to give you something last year. I showed you a comic cover that made you cry. So I wanted to, if you could just tell that story. Here it is, the Rifleman number ten. <laughs> I made Mike Grill cry in in. In a good way. Look, he's still laughing. This book here, uh, and what you said to me is, it's the faces. It's their faces. It's like, wow, Paul. And he's like, that's right, son. That's right. So, in all the years that you had never seen that, yeah, it was the great that, it wasn't for that sadness, Mr. Me. Archer. I laugh so hard and tear. <laughs> oh yeah. So I said, "What'd you do to Mike Grill?" I said, "I do nothing to Mike." Grill. Those are happy tears. Those are happy tears. So, uh, Mike, uh, another con story from last year. My buddy, my my best friend, Mike Harbor, he brought you this cover, and you. This is the one you signed for Mike. It says to Mike. It's oh, the famous yeah. pillow biter cover of Action Comics, and he had you sign it because you did the interior. I think it was a. a there was an interior story. It was a Green Arrow, Black Canary story. And you signed it, Mike Grill, and you wrote on top, I did not underline draw this cover. <laughs> so so like, special shout out oh to my, my best buddy, God. Mike Barber, for bringing this. But you got to, oh, yeah, I know. Listen, when you look at it, it really looks bad. When you read it, he's just saying, oh, you telling me you're Clark Kent, I'm dying, tell me your identity. But the thing that makes it look so bad, Superman does this, shows the S, I get that. Why isn't he wearing pants? <laughs> why, is, why does not Superman not have pants on? Yeah. So that that was it. And then the final story that we found out from you, Mike and I found out, on a book we love so much, 
Detective Comics. This is the one you made to me. Signed me. Detective oh, yeah. Comics. That's such a good story. 455. Listen, I, I, I think this is a 76 book, maybe. 1976 or so, maybe 77. This is one of my favorite Batman stories of all time. Batman and Alfred coming back from a society function. The car breaks down. They go to the spooky house on the hill. And inside it is a vampire. My copy signed by you and on the inside by the writer, Elliot S. Magan. And I was, we were telling you how much we love this book. And I gave this book to my best friend, Mike, and he loved it so much. He is, he is the Johnny Appleseed of this book. He buys it and gives it to people as gifts because he wants to spread the gospel of Detective God. 455. But you added so much to this story. We loved your interiors when you told us that my artistic, that I worship the altar of Bernie Wrightson. And you have to tell us a story about how you ended up drawing this book and what Bernie's contribution was. Yeah, uh, Bernie had done thumbnails of the story, did all the breakdowns of it, but his thumbnails were literally thumbnails. They were, <laughs> they were that big, uh, you know, a, a page about the size of a playing card. And uh, the uh, beautiful drawings. I mean, tiny little gems. But uh, Murray showed them to me along with the script, and he said, "I can't use this. Can you make it bigger and and finish it out?" And I said, "Sure." Um, but Bernie, bless his heart, and God rest his soul, uh, never got any credit for that story, uh, <laughs> which which he really deserved. Um, my uh, my contribution to it was, you know, journeyman. I, I was just a guy who came in at the end and, and put the flashy little touches on it. Um, although I did uh, model my vampire very carefully after Christopher Lee. And, yes, you did. And, and I showed it to Julie Schwartz, and he says, uh, oh, it looks great. Except for one thing, the vampire looks just like Christopher Lee. I went, that's the point. <laughs> yeah. you know, Christopher Lee was the the first time I'd ever seen the, the Dracula character where he scared me. I think it was probably, uh, I think it was probably twenty years old when I when I saw him as Dracula. It was like that that's a one very scary character. Um and he goes, No, yeah, you gotta change it. Give him a Give him a different nose, give him a scar, you know, change his hair. So yeah, what happens? All the fan mail comes in, he goes, That's Christopher Lee, isn't it? <laughs> yep. Yeah. yeah, sure it was. Well, the ending um, of that story was really cool too. How you how, how you guys had it where he where he's able to defeat him. Yep. Yeah, buy buy the book and read it. Um, yes, I'm exactly. Gonna, I don't want to give it away. It, it's a it's cool. You you don't want to know the ending. Until you, no. you read it, because you know. But that that book, Mike, that book has cult status. The people, the people that know, they know how great that book is, and yeah. I think it's, I think it's so cool, and, and I think it, it, it's really neat that you and Wrightson have a connection on that, you know. And so here, are two of my, you know, two of my very favorite artists ever, you know, have, have a connection to this book and you know i like i said i i loved bernie's work and you know still do and think it's just you know i don't know that anybody draws black and white like bernie does i mean the, the no, just but the, the fact that, oh absolutely yeah. and the fact that you and um you and he collaborated on that book and like you said poor bernie doesn't get any credit for it but i see his spirit in it though i really do i see his spirit and what you've added to it again the Christopher Lee aspect was just brilliant. It, I mean, that, that just adds so much extra fun to that story. And it's just, again, to me, this is probably my favorite standalone Batman story ever. So it's, and look how many years it's been and it still stands up as a, as a, thank as a you. fan. I appreciate favorite. that. Yeah. It's, well, it's thank fantastic. you. Um, I wanted to go back to something uh, from a little bit ago where, um, you said the the shaman tears is getting the the podcast. I had read something a while ago that you were working on screenplays for John Sable and for Shaman's Tears. So is that something you're still working on, or is the podcast kind of taking the place of the 
what the screenplay um, for the, the, would be. The and, podcast is going to be, be 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 based partly on my screenplay. Um, the um, Sable, the, yeah, the, the screenplay is, is finished on on Sable and on Maggie the Cat. Uh, I've had good response from several people who have expressed interest right now uh, because of the the writer strike and sag after uh, being out on strike. Uh, every everything is on hold. It's all in limbo uh, until all, right. all that stuff is settled. Uh, wouldn't be the first time that something has happened uh, um, back years ago. Um, <coughs> we were a, a gnat's whisker away from a green light on Sable, and uh, uh, there was a um, actor strike pending that would take the actors out of the box um, if, if they went out on strike uh, uh, the 1st of July. So the cutoff for any production that was going to, going to be made was literally the Ides of March, 15th of March in that year. And uh, they thought about it and they said, rather than rush this into production, we're just going to hold off until after the strike is over probably by October, the strike would be over. And uh, then we're going to do it right. Uh, unfortunately, on 9-11, the Twin Towers came down and the company, the studio, lost all our backing. They, they, Gene Simmons from KISS was uh, producing uh, and um, Gene lost five movies in a phone call. It just wow, yeah, wow. yeah, and and they never came back to it. So I, I, I got the property back in turnaround, and uh, that's that's the way it's been. But uh, I have sort of a, an A minus, you know, big on TV, uh, not so big in in film, but a, a guy who's expressed interest and. Um, we were talking to his agent uh, just before the strike. I was uh, literally on the verge of pushing the button to send my screenplay. I already sent them the novel and the comic books, the uh, graphic novels, so they could uh, get up to speed on it. And they wanted to look at the screenplay, but um, once the strike uh, happened, my agent said, probably not a good idea to send this until the strike's done so looking forward to it so can you uh, uh, can you share with us who the actor is or is that something you want to keep you no, can't I, give that away I, I, right unfortunately uh yeah if, if, if you open your open your mouth in in some way shape or form somebody's going to take offense and uh, or get bent out of shape and go uh, blah 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 blah. Um, Danny could tell you, but then he'd have to kill you. <laughs> I don't want that. <laughs> no, no, that man knows how to use weapons. So would you say um, that there's a, a couple of a couple of years ago? Um, I had figured that um, um, Colin Farrell would make a great Sable. I still think he would. Yeah. Um, and. Um, who else? Aaron Eckert was mentioned at one point. Um, trying to think who else. Thomas Anson Reed Mount would probably be. You know, An Anton Mount from um, Hell on Wheels. Oh, yeah. yeah. Star Trek yeah. now. Star Trek, right. Um, you yeah. never know. Um, weirder things have happened. At one point, Gene Simmons. Started out playing Sable on the yeah, TV. He played him in the in the pilot for the TV show, right? Yes, yes, yep, yep. He started out. Uh, he he was in the role for about a week. Um, if you watch the pilot episode, there's one scene where he comes in the door of his apartment, mostly in silhouette, wearing a hat. That's Gene. Wow. <laughs> um. Another thing I wanted to I wanted to touch back on that you had mentioned earlier was when you were talking about 
you know, you'll get 38 cent checks from DC, but you get zero royalties from Marvel. Like you were in the, in the industry for decades before, you know, working for DC and working for indie stuff before you ever did anything with Marvel. Was that, was that a conscious choice that you didn't go to Marvel or was it just no. something that was just kind of circumstance? No, it, it, in fact, uh, uh, I was at San Diego Comic Con uh, several years back. I think it might have been 2008 or nine, something like that. Uh, walking through the lobby of the Hilton Hotel, and Stan Lee was there talking to someone. And uh, he looked up and said, Hi, Mike. Hey, how come you never did any work for us? And I said, I've, You guys were my first call, as a matter of fact. Um, the, the, the day that I went to Julie Schwartz's office, I stopped at Marvel first and uh, talked to John Romita. And John said, sorry, kid, we don't have anything for you. And so I went on to DC and Stan said, I'm going to have to have a talk with him. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, it was, it, was, it was years before I did it. Um, uh, stupidly um, had a conversation with um, Chris Claremont. Uh, he said, so Mike, when are we going to get together and do mutants? And I said, Chris, I'm, I've got Sable going now and I'm just really happy doing what I'm doing and I'm, I'm tired of superheroes. And it didn't dawn on me at the time that uh, we were up in Canada and Chris had flown there in his private Lear jet. <laughs> I, I have an uncanny knack for making all of the worst decisions you could possibly imagine. Um, and it, it wasn't, it wasn't for another ugh, two decades that I wound up doing any work for Marvel. For Marvel. If you could have if you could have gone and and worked on any character from Marvel, like I know you wrote Iron Man, but if you could have Captain America drawn, you would have you would have picked Cap. Captain America. That's yeah. that is my personal favorite character. You made him very happy just now, yeah. Mike. You made him very happy. Now, now I need to get you. Now I need to to see you at a convention and get you to do a uh, a commission of Captain America. There you go. You can see what I, my my take for Captain America to write and draw is. Real simple. Um, Steve Rogers, the original Captain America, is fed up with what's happened to the world. He's he's from the greatest generation. Yeah. Um, and and doesn't recognize our country anymore. Because things have changed so damn much. So he climbs on his motorcycle and sets out to find America. A man, a motorcycle, America. That, that would be a fantastic story. I was going to ask, I, I saw you haven't done anything, you know, any new work in the industry. Um, it was 2012, 2013, you did the digital comics for the Arrow TV show, but you haven't done any any new books since then. What would it, is there anything, I, is there any new yeah, my, my contribution my contribution uh, recently has been um, to the um, 80th anniversary issue of uh, Green Lantern, and uh, okay, yeah, the, I that. yeah, in the, and Green Arrow, and, yeah, in, in the Green Lantern Green Arrow story that I did, uh, that was that was Denny's, okay, and, yeah, uh, yeah. Um, but apart from that, um, when we reprinted the first two issues of Maggie the Cat, I added 15 new pages to that issue oh, okay. that, um, yeah, that would bring the storyline in line with my screenplay, uh, fleshed it out, give the, the characters much more dimension. Mike, that, that 80th anniversary of um, Green Arrow, that was my favorite comic that year. That book, um, I thought it was a wonderful um, compilation of great creators that had worked on that character. And there were four stellar stories in there. And it did my heart good to see you drawing 
a green arrow story and writing it in that book. That was fantastic. Me there too. was a, Oh, uh, there's, there's a wonderful, gosh, there's a wonderful story in there where wildcat was training green arrow and beating his ass in the ring. He didn't, re he didn't realize that Ted Grant was wildcat. And so he was training with this old guy that was handing him his lunch. And then that beautiful final story um, a, as a tribute to Denny that had no words, but had, yeah, where the where the where the word balloons are, there were pictures. That was that was that, one of the most written tributes. by Denny's son, by his son, absolutely. Yeah. So that book that you worked on, um, I, I'm not sure exactly what year, if it was 2021 or 22, but whatever. When we did our picks at um, for our show on comics of the year, that was my favorite comic of the year, and it, certainly um, in part due to your great contribution on a brand new um, Green Arrow story. And to see you write that was just bringing it home again, man. So, uh, you know, again, you, you know, even currently, uh, you know, you put, a, you put a few pages in and it just makes a book magic. So thank you, sir. Thank you. I appreciate that. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Do you have any other new projects that you are going to be working on or anything that you would want to, like, you know, a, um, any new creator-owned stuff or, you know, would you go back to Marvel and DC for maybe, maybe not like an ongoing series, but maybe a mini series or, or anything like that? If Marvel gave me that shot at Captain America, I'd do it in a heartbeat. That um, I mean, that sounds like it would be a fantastic, yeah, uh, a fantastic yeah. series. Um, and, and the time is right. I mean, oh yeah, is definitely. Well, well, you um, know, it's that 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 concept of it too, Mike. It certainly sounds like it shares a little being a little DNA with the great Denny O'Neill, Neil Adams, Green Lantern, Green Arrow. When they went across to America, I would love to see your take on that with Cap, you know, going across to America to find America. I think that would be a great, God, a great one two punch of these great characters, you know, and, and here, and you know, those Denny O'Neill, um, Neil Adams, Green Lantern issues where they did that. I mean, the issues, racism, um, drug abuse, uh, ecological rights, uh, uh, Native American rights, worker rights. It's a shame none of those topics are important anymore, right? That they, <laughs> <laughs> that they made that, right? That, it's incredible. I mean, you know, being sarcastic, of course, but how relevant that those books still are, you know, when they were discovered in America. And I think that that would be the exact same thing if you were to do that, uh, that Captain America book discuss all these topics that are still so relevant or relevant in the real world you know our our, our wonderful two-dimensional world through great creators like you become a fully three-dimensional you know world of immersion when we go through these so um when when you when you tell us these stories that touch our real lives i think that's where that's the sweet spot i think for comics i i just think the the nature of the the wandering hero uh, is is so strong the you know the the image of the guy on a motorcycle sending off the cross country um you know you have you have the, the the original guy the original guy looking for what's been lost and he finds yeah. it i mean he, he would find it uh if if you if you look we're all much. I mean, face it, we came yes. from everywhere. And mm -hmm. people came to this country a hundred years ago. My grandparents, longer than that, 115 years ago. Um, and they were, they were looking for an opportunity. And this was the place you could find it. Uh, some people came here fleeing oppression some people came uh because it was the the land of golden opportunity some people um came because of wars in their homeland uh trying trying to get away from uh, a place that was just impossible to live anymore and they were welcomed they were welcomed not like it is anymore i mean yeah um and it's too bad, you know, the, the Statue of Liberty, you know, uh, give me your poor, your weak, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. Like, 
give me those yeah. people. Bring them here. Send them here. Mike, I, I, Mike, I agree 100. percent You know, I have, I have family that was at Valley Valley Forge, and I still am an immigrant to this country. I'm still an immigrant. Doesn't matter that I've had family here for hundreds of years. Unless you're a Native American, you're an immigrant to this country. So, I mean, uh, I, I, I echo that sentiment, my friend. Yeah, and Cap is such a perfect, like you said, he's such a perfect, you could do a story like that with any character, you know, with, you know, the right writing, but Cap is such a perfect character to do it with because of who the character is and because of, you know, of his right. background, you know, right. kind of being the man out of time. I'll tell you what, when I when I win the Mega Millions, I'll uh, contact you and I'll commission you to uh, to do that story for me. There you go. <laughs> my, my wife just just poked her head in the door and went. <laughs> yeah. There you go. We, we've been at this for almost two hours, guys. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it, it, let's let's and we bring off for tonight and do it yep. again. All right. Well, um, I. I want to thank you for taking this time. It's, it's been fantastic. I know you did say uh, one thing you wanted to touch on was the Green Arrow or the Green Lantern Green Arrow uh, hardcover that's coming out that you're writing the, um, the introduction for. Yes, it's a it's a reprint uh, volume of the Hard Traveling Heroes. Um, uh, it's going to contain all of uh, my stories from uh, back in the seventies. And Denny's last story as well. Excellent. And um, so when I when I read that that script and saw that in the last panel he had written the end, I turned to Mary and said, "That's it, Denny's done." Yeah. And sure enough, he never lived to see that book in print. Mm. Well, I I've, had the, the great honor and pleasure. Of working with a man, I learned more about good storytelling by drawing Denny's stories than I ever learned in any writing class I ever took, ever. A true legend. I agree with you 100%. Denny O'Neill is definitely a legend in this field. And, um, you know, the comics world would be lessened without his influence in it. So I agree with you 100%. On Absolutely. That. Oh, yeah. Both on the printed page and what he did behind the scenes, right? Yep, absolutely. Hey, every, everything that everything that I've done in comics, I owe it to Denny. I mean, I, I, I really do. Um, Green Lantern, Green Arrow was what got me interested in comics again after getting away from it uh, for so many years, and uh, just being able to sit on and talk with him uh and uh, go over some of these stories just fantastic memories fantastic 50 years is a long time to be doing anything but uh, now that i think back on it i don't think i worked a single day they say if you uh, love what you do you'll never work a single day in your life yeah well, well mike i want to thank you for joining us and i want to thank you for like i told you this is also I'm coming up on my 50th anniversary of being a comic collector, and you sure Thanks for buying me all that food. It's yeah, <laughs> exactly. It's on getting. Hey, absolutely, my brother. I got to feed the beast that's producing all this great entertainment. But you, you, my friend, um, are a great, you know, reason why I stayed in this industry. I never quit collecting, not for one day. I never stopped. I always had enough time for comics, for girls, and for football. I made time for those priorities. But um, you are a, a you're a true part of my um, you know, right. my childhood yeah. and my collection. So thank you for all these 50 years that you've been in this industry that I love so much. Thank you for sitting down with us and enlightening us and, and telling us about these wonderful aspects of your career. Uh, I just think you're fantastic, and thank you for joining us. The pleasure has been 100% mine, guys. Look yes. forward to talking again. Yeah, I would Thanks. love to. You said you, you know, the when you have the next Sable project that goes on Kickstarter, um, maybe when the the Shaman's Tears podcast is coming up, like you know, whenever you absolutely, yeah, you know, whenever absolutely. you have one of these things, we'd love to have you come back on and talk with us again because this has been, I mean, this has Will been a, this has been an amazing night talking with you. Thanks, guys. I Thank appreciate you. it. I'll see you at the cons. I'll see you at the cons. All I'll right. See you. All right. Yes, sir. Cheers. 
Thank I'm you. Gonna get out of here. Oh, there it is. Yeah, I'll make sure leave. To, I'll Apparently, make sure that's like that, uh, you know, get a, a nice Captain America commission from you now. <laughs> there you go. You're the there you go. All right. Have a good right, night. Well, all right. Thank you, lovely Cheers. wife, for letting you letting you talk to us. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for thank thank, thank her uh, for let us borrowing you for the night. So, um, again, you know, this has been the the great Mike Grell. Um, what was your website again? MikeGrell.com. Yep. Mike. Real you know, simple. Yeah. Go check out his website, MikeGrell.com. Um, go up to him at a convention. You know, get a fantastic commission like the uh, the one Gary had, and. Um, yeah, show that again. That's just absolutely gorgeous. It, it is. It is a. It is a prize in my collection. And uh, you know, make sure you know. Thank you for uh, watching us. Make sure to check us out at thecodexstation.com and on all the socials. Just type in the Codex Station. So once again, Mr. Grell, thank you for taking the time to speak with us. And, thank you, uh, gentlemen. Until next time, we will catch you by the spinner rack. Thank you. <laughs>